dark matter. Dark matter refers to material that gives off no light which is why we call it dark. Now I'm not talking about just visible light, I'm talking all wavelengths. It doesn't matter if you look gamma ray, x-ray, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, microwaves, or radio waves, you are not going to see it. And it has gravity. I don't know why I spelled has with two s's. And so that's why it's called matter, because we think of matter as something that has gravity. So dark matter, something that has gravity, but we cannot see it. It doesn't matter what wavelength of light we look, we cannot see it. And as bizarre as all of that is, what's even worse, Best we can tell, more than 90% of our universe is made of dark matter. Um, in this graphic, it's about 96%. Only 4% of the universe can we see. So that's disturbing that we look out, we see all these stars, all these galaxies. Our universe seems to be teeming with things that give off light, and yet that only accounts for roughly 4% of the universe. So if we can't see it, how do we know dark matter is there? Because of the gravity. And there are two main things that we observe. But like I said, in both cases, what we're looking for is the gravitational effect of matter on things we can see. So, what are the things that we can see? Well, one thing we can look at is the rotation curve of a galaxy. Well, what does that mean? Well, in particular, we're looking at spiral galaxies. Because a spiral galaxy, if we look at it more or less edge on here, that's my horrible drawing of a spiral galaxy, we can measure how fast things are moving at various points within the galaxy. Because one side of the galaxy is going to be moving towards us, the other side is going to be moving away. We can get nice little Doppler shifts. And so a rotation curve basically goes from the center out. So that's going to be velocity versus distance from center. find out, okay, how fast is this part going? Well, we'll make a dot there. How fast is this part going? Eh, maybe it's that fast. And so on. And so we get some kind of curve showing us how fast the different parts are going as we move from the center of the galaxy out to the edge. Well, what we expected and what we got were two different things. What we expected is called a Keplerian rotation curve. And that's this red line right here, which I'm now tracing with a green line. So that's our Keplerian prediction. This basically says that, right here's the edge of the central bulge. If you can read that. And so here we're seeing uh, the speed gets slower with distance. But 
the farther out you go. And that's called Keplerian because Johannes Kepler studied our own solar system and the motions of planets. And in our solar system, the planets closer to the sun move faster. And we thought that a spiral galaxy would kind of behave the same way. Because when we look at a spiral galaxy, it looks like the central bulge has most of the mass. Just like our sun has most of the mass. Because stars are very close together in the central bulge. And so when you get to the outer parts of a spiral galaxy, uh, stars are more spread out. And so that's going to be more like the planets going around the sun. So they thought it was going to follow the same rule. And in both cases, whether it's planets going around the sun or sparse stars going around a very concentrated group of stars in the central bulge, You've got most of the mass in the center. And that's what a, galaxy, a spiral galaxy looks, looks like. It looks like most of the mass is in the central bulge. So we thought we were going to get this graph, this nice Keplerian curve. That is not what we actually observed. Instead, what we observed is called a flat rotation curve. And that's this green line here, which I'm going to trace with a blue line. So what we see is the speeds don't change with distance. So in order for that to be the case, we can't have most of the mass in that central bulge, but instead more evenly distributed throughout. So you've got mass pretty much concentrated everywhere, not just concentrated in the center, which clearly is not what a spiral galaxy looks like. So. Where's this mass that we can't see? Whoop. And so the hypothesis is it's in the halo. So here's our halo. And so we've got our galaxy kind of embedded in a soup of dark matter. So we've got all this mass surrounding us, influencing the motions of these stars as they orbit around the center of the galaxy. And we have this mass just everywhere. So that's motions within a single galaxy, and in particular a spiral galaxy, is what this applies to. There's a second place we see evidence for dark matter. That's looking at the galaxies in a cluster. Now in a cluster, galaxies orbit around the center of mass of the cluster. Because recall, a cluster is gravitationally bound together. So all of these galaxies stay together, but they are in motion. They're all orbiting around this 
center of mass somewhere. So they all have speeds associated with their orbit. But they're moving really fast. In fact, they're moving too fast. They should break free from the cluster. But they don't. So the only way you can have fast-moving galaxies stay in a cluster, not break free and go off on their own, is there needs to be more mass holding the cluster together. You know, we can estimate the mass of the galaxies based on how bright they are and all of that. But when we look at all the mass of all the galaxies in a cluster, it's not enough to hold it together. There has to be something else. But whatever it is, we can't see it. So, back to dark matter. And in this case, when we're talking about an entire cluster, we say that the dark matter is between the galaxies. So here's our cluster of galaxies. And we see galaxies here. And we see where the dark matter needs to be. So now the galaxies are kind of embedded in this soup of dark matter. but now it's between the galaxies instead of just uh, surrounding a single galaxy. So dark matter may be everywhere, uh, but it's certainly in the halos of galaxies, and it is between the galaxies found in clusters.